<laughs> uh, thank you, Bruce. You you covered it well. And, oh, that's beautiful back there. That's just gorgeous. God's God's beauty. You know, you, you just can't outdo God. I don't care what. I don't care how. You can't outdo God. Can't hear me. Can't hear me. Okay. Where's the zeal? <laughs> okay. All right. Sound better? Okay. Well, I was just commenting on how beautiful the flower was and that you can't outdo God. It's, he's got the corner on the market. <laughs> yes. In all ways, all things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And man's imitation is just that, imitation. <laughs> But that's not what we're here to talk about this time. We talked last week, for those who weren't with us, we went diving. We dove deep. We dove into the spring of the well of our salvation. We saw water in scripture from Bereshit to Revelation. It was exciting. And all this week, how many of you saw more verses on water? Good, good. I did too. I did too. In fact, I can't even think right now, but I saw one today and I thought, how did I miss that one? <laughs> but you know, the, we talked. I'm sorry? Am I all wet? No. You didn't have enough time. Remember, there are over 700 that we know specifically mention water, and then we get to over, what was it, 2,000 with the references toward. Jim, may I ask you to do me a favor? <laughs> the clipboard, can you turn it upside down? The light is reflecting right on it and right into my eyeballs. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It was just perfectly lined up. Thank you. My apologies, but I was getting blinded. Maybe I was seeing the light. <laughs> Yes, my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, how bright he is. Remember, he's his, his Shekinah glory that's so bright. And all this is good. All of these analogies are great because we're going to see that we need to be rooted. And we need to be rooted deep. And, you know, that fits with our springs and our water and all last time. We need to have our roots grow down deep. When you see a tree that's thirsty, you know where the roots are? At the surface. But a tree that's not thirsty, those roots have gone down deep. They're drinking deep and they're being satisfied. And we know our root that we need to be tied to and deep with is none other than Yeshua. Whether we're Jewish or whether we're Gentile, it doesn't matter. Whether we're grafted in or whether we're natural branches, it all goes down to that root. And I wish you could see the picture in my mind because I see this healthy tree. And instead of seeing it covered at the ground, it's exposed to show a root system that is going down deep and drinking from that well of our salvation. And if we are tied into that root, if we are putting our roots down deep into Him, then we should care about the plan of God. You know, that's just, everybody's got an agenda, everybody's got ideas, and everybody wants to do what they want to do, but God has a plan. He has a master plan that he had before he created the foundations of this earth, this world, and he has individual plans also, we know that, but from the very beginning, God has shown divine design. He's shown his divine plan, and he's shown that no matter what man does, man does not interrupt his plan. I'll take you all the way back to the garden, and in the garden we have man right away enter into sin, or at least right away in, in to us because of what we read in the scripture. And that was not a surprise to God. Do you really realize God knew when he was forming Adam what Adam was going to do. And he chose to make him anyway. If that isn't love. And we see from Bereshit to Revelation, we see a God of love. We see a God who wants a relationship with his human beings that he has created. And we see his love manifested greatest in his plan of redemption. When we see that and we realize that God chose to reveal himself to mankind, 
I just stand in awe. There are days when I just think, why, Lord? Why? What made you care so much when this world is so evil and you knew it would be? And then I realize God had such love. He couldn't contain it. He wanted to give it out. And he doesn't see and stop short with the evil like you and I do. He sees that entire plan and even works that evil into good according to his purposes. And that is a mind blower for me also. And if you've ever seen him take something intended for evil in your life and turn it around and make it good, all I can do is just close my mouth because it's dropped open and I just stand in awe. Every parasha, we go through 52 parashas, 54 if you count our extras that come in. Every parasha, we see God's hand. Every parasha, we see God's love. Every parasha, we see God's plan. So why do we stop and think, and, and Bruce said it earlier, we make our plans and God laughs. <laughs> <laughs> but why do we get so involved in wanting to make our plans and take our plans to God? Shouldn't it be the reversal of that? If we're digging into his, deepening ourselves into his root, into him, then we've got it backwards. We need to flip that. And this parsha is just absolutely full of the example of what, what when we're doing our own versus when we're in tune with God. And we see even the hand of God in love through this parasha. Now, don't make any mistake, because I'm not saying that because God loves that he's going to overlook, that you get a get-out-of-jail-free card, that you can just do whatever. Because we see in this parasha, we saw the Israeli. He was Israeli. He was flaunting his desire in the face of God. He was doing such immorality right outside the tabernacle that he didn't get away with it. He, when in the face of God, there was dire consequences. And if you don't know, you need to read it. But he lost his life. That's not honorary. That's not mean. And that's not unloving. That is love. Because love requires. Love does not just say, oh, you can do anything and get away with it. And Pichas, we see, greatly rewarded, greatly rewarded, brought into the family line of the priesthood, and that it would pass down to all his generations. Because he stood for God, he had that zeal for God, because he took a step forward. Do you realize his family perpetually was blessed? I hear so many times parents say that they want their children's lives to be better than theirs. They want to bless their children. They want to see their children better than they were. Well, how about for a thousand generations? That's what Pinchas got. Blessing all the way down. God has a plan, and God is zealous for his plan. And he is going to bring people in line with his plan. And if they're not in line, there are consequences. And we, we see that especially when we see that he even said it, that Pinchas made atonement for the people of Israel. That's what's so important. Atonement at one meant that coming into a right relationship with God. And that was part of God's plan right from the beginning. He made his plan known through scripture. We're told that he, he made his plan known by word, by the word through the prophets. And here we even see that Moshe couldn't go into the promised land because when we see he was representing law, law does not save. Law does not bring us into the promised land. But notice the name of the one who could bring them in, Yeshua. God saves. That's why there had to be a change there. There was more reason behind it than that. But we see that the chosen by God are taken into the promises of God. That he, again, his intent and his plan, it's going to happen. No matter what you do or what you don't do, his plan is going to continue. And it's going to be right on time and it's going to be exactly as he had ordained it. And when we look for that plan in scripture, 
we do see that God chose to work through a specific nation. He chose to work through a person, and he chose to work through that person's progeny who became a nation. And there are people that will get all up in arms and all upset, and I know here I'm on safe, <laughs> friendly territory, but they don't like that. They don't like that God chose. And you know what? I'm just going to stand here and tell you, well, I'm sorry if you don't like it. When you create an entire world, when you bring people into existence, when you are the sole authority, then you can make it your way. But God in his sovereignty, who can outdo our God? He is ineffable and his plans are indescribable. And to take humankind through thousands of years from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of attitudes and all the rest and be able to master plan the entire. You ever played a game of chess? You've got a move in mind. And you think through several moves down the line. You think you've got it all lined up and you're going to be taking on your opponent. And all of a sudden your opponent does something up here at step one. And you can just throw out plans two through seven and start all over again. God isn't playing a game of chess where, oh, now I have to. And I want us to see that. Because sometimes I think we forget or we certainly don't act like the sovereign God is working sovereignly in our lives. And when we realize that, I will tell you, check your mouth at the door if you want to complain because I don't see that being a healthy response to our God. And his plan is best. Yeshahu, Isaiah 55, his plans are higher than our plans. His ways and our ways are his thoughts and our thoughts. But right here, right here, seeing that God has a plan, knowing that he's working his master plan, and I'll say it if you haven't picked it up, it's through the nation of Israel. That's the relation that he chose. Now, again, and I will remind you, he did not choose Israel because they were mighty men. He didn't choose them because they were great numbers. He didn't choose them because they had done great accolades, and he didn't choose them because the world would say, wow, yeah, that's the one to choose. <laughs> Throw it all out and be told, hey, you guys, you're the runt. You're the least likely. You're the less in number. There's nothing to, for there to be glory in you. So my glory, God speaking, will shine. And that's what it's all about. It wasn't that he exonerated a people and said, these people are better than all the other people. Well, I really had a good day when I made the Jews. That isn't what he was saying. <laughs> But he did make a master plan, and he intended to work it through Israel. He intended Israel to represent him to the rest of the nations, and when Israel let down on their part, God's plan didn't go awry, and he didn't suddenly come up with plan B. He's still in control, and he's still working, and we will see him bring Israel all the way through completely receiving every promise he made for her and fulfilling every plan he had to reach an entire world. That's a master plan. That's a master hand. That's the, the what do they call the, the one who's the best? There's a name for it, especially in chess, and I can't think right now, but he's not the apprentice. He's the, the master. I'm just going to call him the master. I think that's the word I may have wanted. But... Even knowing what we know about God and seeing in Scripture this master plan, there's one that has the audacity to come up in the face of God and say, no, no, that worship, that's going to come to me. I'm going to get this whole world to follow my plan, to do things my way. And he's tried to wreak havoc from the very beginning. I'll explain a little more why he did it when it started. I think you all know. Let me just say in case I forget to get back. But it started in heaven when he decided that he should be on the highest throne and all the worship and all the attention should go to him. He had a kingdom. His kingdom was this earth. He had freedom on this earth. He had all kinds of beauty. He had everything going for him. Till that sin of pride rose up in his heart. 
and I think I'm talking the most who know. But in short, he lost his kingdom in judgment. And that kingdom being this earth, God recreating the earth, putting man into that kingdom and putting man to rule over it. Well, you know how well that went down with Satan? I'm going to get that man to watch me, to worship me, to follow me, to do it my way. And it didn't take long before he, in the garden, got man to fall. But he didn't get the earth back because Yeshua had the plan to redeem the mankind, to redeem the, the, the whole of the, the world. And he countered anything that Satan had planned and thought would be his by his perfect gift, that gift of redemption that I mentioned earlier. He's been in control the whole time. The problem with mankind, and I say problem, but what's, what's akin to all this is God made us with free will. He did not make us that he can pull the strings and like the little dolls we kids played with, I love you, mommy. <laughs> and do whatever you pulled that string or made that, that doll or whatever to do. He gave that freedom. And in that freedom, he's given us every reason to want to follow him, to want to love him, to see that he's got the best for us if we line up with him. But he still leaves it for each to choose individually. And in the midst of that is Satan, who does freely go throughout the face of this earth at this time. There will be a time when, hallelujah, that will end. But at this time, the adversary is wreaking havoc. When we talk about war, we talk about the theater of Europe for World War II. Well, the theater that I'm talking about is not Europe. It's not Asia. It's not the Middle East. It's not America. It's not just Israel. This realm that we are fighting and that we see this in is a, it's a heavenly realm, but hear that right. The prince of the powers of the air. I'm not talking about God's heaven. But we know in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, it says we're not struggling against human beings. We're not struggling against flesh and blood. We're struggling against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, governing this darkness against the spiritual forces of evil. And then it says it in the heavenly realm. So that's why I chose to say it's the heavenly realm. You might call it space war. <laughs> okay? Now, it doesn't just stay in space. That's our space that we're breathing and, and working in. It does pour over onto this earth. So the battle is global. The, the theater is global. I don't care where you are. It's global. And it began when the adversary wanted the place of God wanted him to everything to come to him losing his kingdom on earth and the battle has really begun at that point he thought he had a great victory when he got Adam and Eve to fall in the garden but God had a plan I love it I love it God knew before Adam and Eve sinned that they were going to and he'd already put into motion the plan of redemption. We read that all over in scripture. So God had the master plan. It didn't upset his plan. He's continuing to carry it. Now, I have to tell you, Satan is not stupid. I wish he were, <laughs> but he's not. He can see that God has a plan. He can read. He can hear. He is in heaven and, and knows things from, from his existence in heaven. He knows that God has a plan. He knows that God chose a man. He knows that God chose a nation. And so the fight is on. Okay? And yes, we can talk about a geographic, a physical location. We can talk about a piece of real estate that God chose to put his name on. Because that's what God says. He said that, that he would put his name here. And him talking Israel. And he would put his name on his people. And he talked about it from before Avraham. But I'll just pick it up at Avraham. And he promised it to Avraham. And then from Avraham to Yitzhak. From Yitzhak to Yaakov, Jacob. And to his descendants forever. Now just in simple, very quick terms, he did not promise it to Avraham to Ishmael and to Esau. He promised it to Abraham, 
Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, the descendants that come after that. He promised it in Bereshit 12, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 17, and Genesis chapter 26 to the three major patriarchs that I just mentioned. And I'm going to put a disclaimer in here right now because I don't want to lose any of you. I want you to realize I'm not talking about politics here. I'm not even talking about religion here. I'm talking about God, God's plan, and God's kingdom. I'm talking about God's word. I'm talking about God's kingdom that he says is going to come down to this earth. God said this. Now to have a kingdom, you have to have a king. That's pretty simple, okay? Who's king? Yeshua, king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, close to the end of what we know till we go into eternity future, we see who is king and we see where he comes and we see him set up his kingdom and we know that his perfect plan in the perfect time is being fulfilled. That's what I'm talking about. People will get off and they'll, they'll miss it. They'll think that this is, is political. They'll think it's religious. It's not. But let me tell you that God is at work. And he is working his mighty plan. And we see his faithfulness all the way through. I can take you through Israel's history in its entirety and see that. And Israel's history is not a happy history. It's not a carefree and, and the best has been there. It's been trials and tribulations. It's been pogroms and it's been holocaust. It's been October 7th and August 9th in many years in the past that we'll be talking about Tisha B'Av coming up very soon that we will talk about. Did I say it wrong? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. And we'll see the hand of God move through all of it. But one thing that's very interesting is that God, to have God's plan fulfilled, there are certain things that have to happen. And one of the very first and major things is that Israel has to be back in her land. That's just fact. Now, if you don't like the fact that God chose a people, chose a land, chose to put the people in that land, Go argue with God, okay? <laughs> but Israel has to be back in her land. There has to be a physical restoration. And then what can follow is the spiritual restoration. And that's what we want to see. I'm not telling you that Israel is a perfect nation today. I'm not telling you any nation is perfect. But I'm telling you God is perfect. And his plan is perfect. And he has planned a people in that land called Israel. And he has planned their physical restoration. And he's planned their spiritual restoration. And those two will go hand in hand. And you don't ever see it reversed. You don't see the spiritual come before the physical. But the physical and then the spiritual follows. And Yeshua made it clear also when he said to his people, shortly before he ascended into heaven, he said that he would not come again until Israel says, Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, is Israel saying that today? Sadly, no. Are there individual Israelis? Absolutely, hallelujah. And all around the world there are those. Even if we're in the dispersion. There are a few in this room right here. <laughs> and we're saying it. But when Yeshua said it, he's referring to the whole nation. Let me give you a couple of examples in, in Scripture to show you the pattern that we see that God is at work. I'm going to take you to the prophet Amos, Amos, chapter 9 and verses 14 and 15. Now, God was raising up a nation against the house of Israel. Okay? She's in rebellion. She's going into a I'll put it this way. God's got to take her out to the woodshed because she's being rebellious. He's got to correct her. And so he's going to allow captivity. He's going to allow hardship. We see this repeatedly. I can take it all the way back from the beginning of Israel's history and all the way through. But I love that God never, never leaves Israel in that despair, leaves her in a time of correction without referring to the restoration always chapter 9 yes verses 14 and 15 chapter 6 tells us 
that, that there was a nation that was going to come against Israel because she wouldn't listen. She wouldn't be obedient. But chapter 9, verse 14 and following says, I will, God speaking, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and inhabit the ruined cities. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine, cultivate gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their own soil, no more to be uprooted from their land, which I gave them, says Adonai, your God. Notice the emphasis there. They're going to be in the land. They're going to stay in the land. They're going to put, make crops. They're going to eat from their crops. They're not going to the, um, plant the crops and have someone else reap the benefit. What, what book was that you were referring to? Amos. Yes, yes. It's Amos in Hebrew, but A-M-O-S, Amos, chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Did you hear clearly? God's telling them because of their rebellion, they're going to suffer consequences, but he doesn't leave it there, and he never does. Now, we see in Scripture that they go back into the land, and then spiritual restoration comes, okay? Now, if you notice, they're never to be uprooted from the land again. We don't see that yet. We see that in the sense that we see the return started. We, re we see the nation born in a day. We know that God is at work, but we'll see her reap those benefits in millennial time. We'll see her receive all her blessings. We will see that she's never uprooted at all. Because I believe this is fully and entirely. So when an October 7th happens and some of our people are taken hostage into other countries, other areas, that is saying this has not been fulfilled yet. We see first fruits, but we don't see complete fulfillment. Let me take you to Hezekiel. Ezekiel, you think you're a little more familiar with this prophet? Chapters 36 and 37, no, I'm not going to read it all. <laughs> but you, to get the whole picture, read it on your own. In chapter 36 and verse 24, God says, for I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the lands and I will bring you into your own land. Now that is, wow. Do we hear that? Think about the world. Can you pick a nation, a country, where there isn't a Jewish person? No. <laughs> We scattered well, or badly, whichever way you want to put it. We were dispersed throughout. And God is saying, I'm going to gather you from the nations. Another scripture, and I didn't think to bring it down, says that, that he'll send his angels to bring them back from the four corners of the earth. He's going to gather them from all the lands. And he doesn't say, I'm done with you. He says, I'm going to put you back in your land. We saw that start when Israel became a nation again, in a day, fulfilling Yeshua, Isaiah 6. 66, can a nation be born in a day? Yes, it can. We see first fruits. We see a start. And then I love what follows Hezekiel 36 because if you keep reading, he says that God promises to then sprinkle clean water on them. Remember last week? Sprinkle clean water on them, cleanse them from their filthiness, from their idolatry, give them a new heart and a new spirit. And Hezekiel 37, it expounds on it. That's a very famous chapter for a lot of people. It's that valley of dry bones. And, and the question is asked to the prophet, verse 3 of chapter 37, can these bones live? And the prophet's like, I don't know. He really doesn't know what to say, but this whole chapter is a picture of Israel back in the land like she is today. She's dry bones in that land because she doesn't have the Spirit of God in her. Individually, there are those who do, but as a whole, they're, they, they're not to that point yet. But look what, what God says. And remember, God's got this plan, this master plan, and nothing causes it to fail or even be delayed. So in his perfect time in verse 5, the Lord God says to the bones, Behold, remember when we read, Behold, wake up, get your zeal there. I, God speaking, I am going to make breath enter you. He did that with Adam, and Adam became a living soul. He says, I'm going to make breath enter you so that you may come to life, and you will know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. 
he is going to do it. Verses 11 through 13, those bones are as clear as the entire house of Israel. He's going to open the graves. He's going to bring them out. He's going to put his spirit in them, and they're going to come to life. Verses 25 through 28, I have to hurry through these chapters because it takes me all night if I stop verse by verse. And they will live on the land that I gave. And notice who he said he gave it to. I gave to my servant Yaakov, my servant Jacob. That's Genesis 26 when he gave it to Jacob. I, I, they'll live on the land I gave to my servant Jacob in which your fathers lived, all of the, the generations before, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And my servant David, David will be their leader forever. Ever. Verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Hmm. Covenant of peace. Didn't Bruce mention that with Pinchas? That that's what he got? And how did he get that covenant of peace? He was brought into the priesthood. And it would be for all his children that followed afterward. Are you catching that this is a spiritual that's how they're restored and that's what God's doing and making an everlasting covenant of shalom with them. And I think, oh, Netanyahu even said it. There's no one in Israel has not been touched by this war. How much they want peace. How much they want shalom. Here's how they'll receive it. I will place them. I will multiply them. I'll set my sanctuary in their midst. My dwelling place. You know what your dwelling place is? You call it a home. God's saying, my home. I'm going to put my home among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. And the nations will know I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, who sets her apart holy because she's going to be that nation, a priest to the world. When my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Remember his sanctuary, that's his home. That's where his Shekhinah glory dwelt. That's the tabernacle, the temple. That's what he's talking about. What a promise to Israel. This is what God's saying. This is what he's going to bring to her. And who does it glorify? Israel? No. It glorifies her God. Israel represents her God to the rest of the world. But what a plan. Let me take you to our prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah. And I'm only picking, what, two or three tonight? It, yeah, every prophet touches it. Chapter 30, verse 3 of Jeremiah. <laughs> Behold! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. If you've got fortunes, you're not beggarly and you're not wanting. You've got an abundance. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land I gave to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they shall take possession of it. Chap uh, verses 18 to 24, going on to the end of the chapter, he says he'll restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, remember he promised Jacob. He says, I'll punish their oppressors. Those who come against them, they're going to get their comeuppance. You will be my people. I will be your God. Verse 23, behold the tempest of the Lord. You know what a tempest is? Have you ever seen the, 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 the uh, what comes out of a teapot or the, the twister? Yes, that's the tempest. That's not anything you want to fool with. Especially when it's coming from God. Does God get angry? Yes. Righteous anger. And if you don't believe me that that's what the tempest of the Lord is, then how come the next phrase says, wrath has gone forth? A sweeping tempest. And I just picture that whirlwind, that hurricane or that tornado and all the destruction that's left behind. And he says it will whirl on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and accomplished the intent of his heart. Is that his plan? Do you see it from the beginning He's carrying out his plan, his heart. 
And it says in the latter days, you'll understand this. You know why they'll understand it in the latter days? They'll see it. They're going to live through it. They're going to see it. It's one thing to read, but if you are doing what I'm doing right now with world conditions and what's going on, and you're keeping your Bible open and your newspaper open, and you're saying, you know what? I understand this a little bit more. Sometimes in a horrible way, but sometimes in an exciting way also. But that's what he's saying. And it, and here in, in Jeremiah 30, again, he's restoring Israel physically. In Jeremiah 31, I love, I love 31, God's love. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you out with kindness. I will build you again, and you will be rebuilt virgin of Israel. And even calling her virgin, that means that she's not off in idolatry. It means she's pure and being right with her God. This is his promise to her. He says in verse 7, the remnant of Israel will be saved. In verse 8, he says, I'll gather you from the remote parts of the earth. There'll be a great assembly. Verse 9, he says, I'll lead them by streams of water. And I went right back to last week. And remember, the sheep won't drink from a roaring. It's got to be a quiet stream. Verse 10, he who scattered Israel will gather him. And as a shepherd keeps his flock. You know what's interesting? Oh, let me give you verse 11 first. Verse 11 says he'll ransom and redeem Jacob. Okay, so 10 talks about him being a shepherd. 11 says it's to ransom and redeem Jacob. You know the first time God is mentioned as a shepherd referred to, and this is Elohim, God, being referred to as a shepherd in Scripture, the first time is in relation to Yaakov, to Jacob, and to Jacob's life. I thought that was very interesting. And he says, you know what comes from that? Joy. Joy is what comes from that. Their life will be like a watered garden. And I don't see thirsty trees. And I don't see flowers that are wilting. I see a beautiful garden. What God intended all the way back from the beginning. And they will never languish again. I'll turn their mourning into joy. And then, if that's not enough of the crescendo for you to understand, he really spells it out. He goes into the promise of the new covenant. As verses 31 to 34, he tells them, I'm going to put that new heart in them. I'm going to give them a, a special covenant between me and them. That I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. My spirit will be in them. They'll have this new heart. I'm not going to do it like the day with the, the, the first covenant with their fathers that they broke. Notice they broke. But God's saying, in my faithfulness, I'm going to make a brit, a new covenant. And then he says, it's going to last forever. You know how you can know it's going to last forever? Look at my creation. Look at my sun. Look at my moon. Look at my stars. Look at the ocean. Look at the waves that are going. If all of that is gone, then I'll abandon Israel. Well, we know. God created those. He put them in space. He holds them in space. He keeps them in space. And he will never let them go. But if he did, then Israel would go also. That's a pretty secure promise. Amazing, amazing what God says. His word never fails. And he even says, if they can measure it, they can measure the heavens, the foundation of the earth. Then there'll be an end to Israel. And I laugh because every time science thinks they're coming to the end, they find out it goes on further. And they'll admit there are even black holes that they have no idea what all is in that black hole. How many more galaxies? Look at the video that I showed us, what, a month or two ago. What was it, 38,000 light years away from here? And just hanging around? Just glorifying God. <laughs> and if that's not enough, verse 40 of chapter 31 says, The entire valley of the dead bodies and the ashes, that shall be holy to the Lord. It'll be uprooted and never overthrown again. Do you see what Jeremiah just did? He verified what Hezekiel said. That out of the ashes... New life 
is going to be poured in. The physical comes and God brings in the spiritual. They're saying the same thing out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. But notice again, each time, Israel's back in her land physically and God restores her spiritually. And then, when she's finally ready, and she does say, Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai, that's when he will come in that kingly manner. Because right now, they didn't get their kingdom when Yeshua came. They didn't re receive their king. They rejected their king. They didn't want their king, so they didn't get their kingdom right then. But God knew. God had a plan, and God's saying now they will receive, and they will get it fully. So, if we can read this and understand it, how much more do you think Satan knows that this is God's plan, knew it from before you and I were ever born, and what do you think he's going to do about it? Oh, I guess I'll go sit down in the corner and I'll give up. It's all over. <laughs> That's why I love our people. We blow the shofar, shofar a hundred times on Rosh Hashanah because the idea is to declare victory, victory, victory. And Satan's going to hear such a great victory. He's going to think, oh, it is over. I have lost. And he'll go away. That's what they hope. <laughs> I laugh. But Satan knows. And Satan wants to destroy God's plan. That's why he's come against Israel as harshly as he has. That's why he's got to try to figure out, i got to ruin God's plan because I want my plan. I want the worship to come to me. So if God's promised this physical land to Israel, i got to do something about that. And he tried. And for many years, we didn't see Israel in the land. But, miracle, for a people to be out of their land, as many years as they were, and still remain a people, it didn't happen to anyone other than the Jews. Others who were out of their land assimilated and have never heard from again throughout our history. But to the Jew, they remained Jewish. They got established again in the land. Now, again, is the time going to say, guess it's all over, I lost. No. He's saying, you know what? God promised them that land. He promised them that they'd never be uprooted out of that land. i got to do something about that. So he sends his henchmen in to uproot, to try to destroy, to try to get them out of the land. And I hear, and I won't say it the, the wrong way, I'll say it the right way, that from the river to the sea, all of Israel will be free. They put another word in there, and they say it wrong. But that's what he's doing. That's why this is going on. You want to know why there can't be peace? You want to know why there's war like this? It's the war in the heavens. It's the war of Satan against our God, the God of Israel, the one true and living God that he's trying to come against. And so he's got to annihilate Israel now. And that's the word. Hamas says it in their creed. They want to annihilate. They do not want to live side by side. And there will never be a two-state solution. They may try it one day because scripture does say they divide the land for the, for the Antichrist gain. But it's not going to do it. It's not going to, it, it'll only be a false and it only lasts for a short time. But if he can annihilate the people, then Yeshua has no people to come back to. He can't bring his kingdom. He's going to be in trouble. And Satan's going to think that he can take over. So that's why the battle is on for that tiny little piece of land. Do you really think the Arabs need that sliver? No. No, they've got 22 Arab countries. And these people came from those other countries. Yes, there are Israeli Arabs that have roots in that land also, but they're the ones that want to live in peace with the Israeli Jews in that land. But God knew and God said, I'm not going to let you destroy Satan. But that's the real fight that's going on. That's not political and that's not religion. That's a fight between God and Satan. That's a fight between right and wrong. And as Netanyahu brought it down and said, it's even between civilization and barbarianism, and I think I said that wrong, but you know the word. <laughs> That's what, Satan, do you think he cares about human life? 
No. He's sowing into the hearts of these that are doing these horrible atrocities. They're following their God. And their God is Satan. And he has to be brought down. And thankfully, thankfully, we've read the final chapter and we know God will win. There will be an end to Satan. There will be an end to the, the enemy of Israel. There will be a major change. But God said it's going to be turbulent in between. And that's what we're seeing. But notice, God never said, as long as Israel listens to me, as long as Israel is right, as long as Israel only does good, as long as Israel dot, 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 he never says that. And in their times of rebellion, in their times of not being right with him, he assures them, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to establish you. In Matthew in the Brit Hadashah, chapter 23, starting with verse 37, it tells us that Israel would kill the prophets. God spoke to them through the prophets. Yeshua, in Matthew, it, it, because it's, it's recording his life, this is where he says, I wanted to gather you like a hen. You ever seen a hen with her little chicks? tucks them all under her wing, make sure they're all safe, they're all fluffy, warm, no matter how bad the world is around them. They're safe and they're secure. That's what he wanted to do. But they wouldn't have him. And so they went into a dispersion. They were scattered not by the hand of God. They were scattered by the adversary because he was working and trying to get his plan in there and trying to take them out. But God says that he would allow them to be scattered, but he that scattered would also bring them back. That's Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 10. I didn't read it when we were there earlier. And that's where we're at today to see those first fruits. But let me take you rapidly into Romans 9 and verse 6 because that also makes it clear. Romans 9, 10, 11, Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future. And in chapter 9 verse 6, he makes it very clear that all of Israel is not Israel. Now, we understand that physically, but we need to understand it spiritually also. Physically, we have Abraham. It does not go through Ishmael. <laughs> it goes through Yitzhak. Now it goes from Yitzhak's son to Yaakov, Jacob, not through Esau. And then it goes through Jacob's descendants, and it's his descendants, 12 tribes that make up Israel today. That's the line. So we see a physical. Not all that are in Israel are of that line. The others were in that area also, but they go off and they form other nations. God had other plans for them. Okay, but we're also needing to see it from the spiritual view. And in the spiritual view, just like we say to us today, what makes you a, and I'll use the word, I'll put it in quotes, Christian. And you'll have all kinds of answers. You'll have, oh, I was born in America. Oh, I go to this church. Oh, I do this or I do that. But literally what it means, and we can put the word Messiah in there because it's better for us for understanding, it's a follower of Messiah. That's what the word means. And so only those that are going to be spiritually in the fold are the ones who are spiritually right with God. When God looks at Israel, he can't condone the Israel that's against his plan, against his will, against his commandments. Okay, and I'm not picking on one to say this is worse than any other, but let me just bring out very clearly, God speaks against homosexuality. So when they're doing a gay parade in Tel Aviv, God's not saying, oh, that's fine, that's okay, here are my kids, do what you want. No, they will suffer consequences. Look what happened to, um, oh, I can't think of his name, the one that was killed, that Pinchas brought death to him and the Midianite woman that was in the act with him. Very clearly, you have to be right with God to enter into the promises of God. Israel will enter into the promises of God when she's right with God as a nation individually now, but as a nation then. But here's the beautiful part. And I know all you dear Gentiles need to hear this. And I want you to hear it loud and clear. Matthew chapter 24. It says there's a condition. Oh, I love it. He's hearing. <laughs> there's a condition that has to happen before Yeshua returns. Returns to Israel, brings his kingdom to Israel, sets up his kingdom, and rules and reigns from Israel throughout this entire world. You know what that condition is? What has to happen first? 
Very good. The Gentile has to be brought in because what it says is the gospel has to go to the ends of the earth for the Gentiles' sake. Because God never overlooked the Gentiles. And he said it's got to go to the ends of the earth. Now you know what I think is just so cool? God is so amazing. You know who he sends to the ends of the earth to reach the Gentiles? Jewish boys and girls. <laughs> the 144,000 that are raised up, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes, they're the ones that go out and carry it to the ends of the earth. He takes the Jewish people and they're finally his priests representing him to the rest of the world. And I, and I do not mean this from a bragging view, but who better to understand the scriptures but from a Jewish person who has that background, who can bring out the Jewish meanings of the scripture, give that full depth, and bring that to the dear Gentiles. That's why many of you are here tonight, because you want to know the Jewishness of your own scriptures. And that's what God's saying. It's going to go to the Gentiles. There's going to be a full number of the Gentiles. I've got... Gentiles that I love that are my people. I've got Jews that I love that are my people. God is not a selective throwing out. He's a bringing in. Because remember how I started out? Whether you're Jewish or Gentile. Whether you're the original branches or the grafted branches. And flying over Romans 10 where Israel is today and looking into Romans 11, we see that grafting in. We see that the original branches, not all, but some were either removed or, or positioned in such a way that there was a place to graft in grafting in a while because they were heathen. They came from the outside. They didn't come from the knowledge of the word of God. And I love what that did to that old tree. It's contrary to nature, but it's what happens when that wild branch is grafted into that old olive tree. It reinvigorates the tree also. So both are getting blessed. And God warns them, don't boast. Don't think you're great. And don't think, hey, the others are out. I get their place because God says, hello. If I did to my original, if I move them to make room for you, what makes you think that you're not going to be in trouble if you take it on from a prideful state? But both, Jew and Gentile, into the same root. Take the drink. Go deep. Get into that same root. Because God never intended it to be two separate trees. He intended it to be together. And finally we see, even the following Shaul Paul's pattern, when he went into a new community, what, where did he go? He went to where, is there a synagogue? Are there Jewish people? He found the women by the riverside who were praying. What do you think they were praying? They were praying the Jewish scriptures. He always started with the Jewish people. He took it past the Jewish people to the Gentiles also. This is just God's order. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah for it's the power of God unto salvation for all who will believe to the Jew first and also equally to the Gentile. It's just his order. But even the one called the apostle to the Gentiles goes to the Jew first and gives it there. And that's what we're seeing. God in abandon. God didn't turn his back on Israel. God's not allowing the sin to be accepted. He's not sweeping it under the rug. But he's made promise to her. I will clean you up. I will remove the filthiness. I will restore you. Then you will see the flourishing and the blessings. And again and again and again, we still see Satan trying to interfere. We see God reaching out to his people and they're not listening. We've talked about it in several um, examples today from Yermia, Ezekiel, our Hoftor portion is Eliyahu, Elijah. And Elijah, and I've got it, oh my word, i got to summarize this. Okay, I hope you know the story. He's just taken out 450 prophets of Baal. Okay, he's on top of the world, but he is also human. And he is exhausted. And if anybody's been in a spiritual battle, you come out of it pretty tired and pretty wiped out. But he also had a real zeal. He had a zeal like Pinchas. 
And when he took on those prophets of Baal, it was on. He made a showdown. He didn't just let this go little. It wasn't just a blip. It would have had every TV camera on it. It would have had film at 11. It would have had the, the headlines in the newspaper. It was a big deal. And to shorten this, because I've got to hurry, when you get Eliyahu, and Bruce brought it out, how he's taken, how God feeds him. Oh, by the way, a new thought to me, and I, I'm following it through, and I, I think it's right. When God, the, the angel, the angel fed him, the cake and the water is a picture to remind Eliyahu the manna and the water. God carrying them through the wilderness. God took him through his wilderness. God fed him and God watered him. And then he brings him to that point and God has to show him it's not always the big manifestations. It's not always the power because what, what he did was quite a powerful show. Okay, he's like Kepa. He, I'm going to chop off the ear. I think he went for the head. I think he wanted to hear and he only got the ear. But anyway, sometimes, and Jonah, Jonah just, oh, I don't even want to go to these people because they don't deserve to be forgiven and I just want to see them all perish. You know, sometimes we're caught up in our zeal for God and we want to make things right and we want to take out that evil. And believe me, right now I could have that attitude toward Hamas. I want to take out that evil. I want to see them fall. I want to see the, t the hostages free. I'd be ready. Let, let's get the sword and let's go. But God shows them. I'm not always in those big manifestations. He shows them the earthquake, the fire. He shows them all the manifestations that came with the giving of the law, that came with God entering covenant with his people. But then when he talked to him, when he got through to him, it was that still, small voice. It was that quiet voice the voice of God. He talks tenderly and he talks lovingly. And when it comes to salvation, let me tell you, very few will be saved by someone with a club pounding them. But everyone will come to salvation when they see the mercy and the love of God extended. Eliyahu teaches us so much. I want to just spend a whole time and focus on him sometime. I love him. I would love to, to just... Ah, oh, there's so much more. But... Here we see all these examples, okay? And I could take you to David, little David. Remember, the Jewish people wear the runs, okay? And here's Goliath, and he's so big. And he's laughing. <laughs> you send me that? And we know the end of the story. But what I want to take you to very quickly, and by the way, where Eliyahu was at Mount Horeb, that's where Moshe also saw the Shekinah glory of the Lord. And it renewed him and it refreshed him and revitalized him. And that's also what happened for Eliyahu. Got to get that in there too. Um, uh, okay, okay. So let me just skip. Let me get to, to where I'm trying to get here in the end. We see all these examples. We see great examples. And we see that God uses everything. He uses drought. He uses famine. He uses war to draw people to him. But it's the mercy and the love, the gentle hand of God that extends. When you see Yeshua putting out his hands on the cross, not fighting like the others who were being nailed to crosses were doing, but the willingness and the love that just oozed from every part of his being. This was the gentleness where God said, what are you doing here, Eliyahu? What are you doing here? And God showed him, I'm still ruling. I'm still in control. And he sends him back. I can't go through all of this, but he sends him back. He sends him back with help. But he also makes it very clear. He sends him back with two who are going to use the sword. If this one doesn't get them, this one will get them. But he also says, but we'll get them with the tender, loving word of the Lord. Rabbi Akiva is a highly acclaimed rabbi in our, in our ancestry. He was over 40 when he was farming. I think he was shepherding, but he was out working anyway. He was not in rabbinical training. And he went to get water out of a stream. And as he was cupping his hand and getting water, it caught his attention right behind. He saw a stone there. And there was water that was just dripping, just drip, drip, drip. And it had etched a hole through that stone. It had eaten away that rock right where that one little drip dropped. 
dropped and dropped. His in awe, the power of that little trip and what he had done. And right then, the, the one that he ends up marrying, Rachel, Rachel by name, uh, who is the daughter of a highly respected rabbi, she came along and, he, and in his lover he's sharing with her and he said, do you think that if I studied the Torah just a drop at a time, that I could make an impact, that I could become a rabbi? And she said, oh, of course, of course you can. Anyone who's willing to study has that opportunity. Oh, but I'm too old. I'm over 40. <laughs> My papa, the rabbi, says, you're never too old. <laughs> what am I hitting on? How many times do we make complaints, excuses, Oh, I can't do that for God. Who am I? God wouldn't call me. God wouldn't ask me. God's going to ask that giant. Look at that person who's doing that. And we find every reason to say that we can't do it. Well, you know what? Can you be a drip? <laughs> Can you just be a drip and trust the Lord in it? Because when he put Eliyahu back in the fight, when he called Moshe, and all our others. It wasn't, again, because they were something. It was because they were willing to rely on God. And that's what I want you to take away tonight. God has a perfect plan. The plan of the world, as I've told you, he has a perfect plan for you. And if he's asking you to do something, quit making excuses. Quit saying, well, I can't go against that giant because a little boy named David could. Okay? You can also. Because all it is, is depending on God. So if you're making any excuse, you're saying, God, you're not good enough. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not right enough. It won't work, God. Really? You want to get in the face of God and tell him that? Look at what's going to happen to Satan. Because he got in the face of God and said, uh, 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 my way. I don't think any of us want to go there. And I'm going to close with one more personal example. And I want you to hear it loud and clear. It's very short. But I'm going to tell you, there's a verse in scripture, Philippians 1, 6, that says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it the day of Messiah. He does it. It's all him. Please hear that. It's all him. 60 years ago to this day, God began a work. 60 years ago today, he tugged at a little Jewish girl's heart. And he said, I want to be your Savior. I want to be your Messiah. And 60 years ago today, I came home from being at my daddy's meeting Three and a half years old, okay? You all know my age now. I don't care. <laughs> Three and a half years old. Simple enough a child can understand it. And I'm sure what happened that day is as my dad gave an evangelical message to a group of adults, there was a little girl there who was hearing the word of God. And I give God full credit for giving me a heart that wanted to hear him. And I told my mommy, she put me to bed. I wasn't even well. I told her I want to pray. She thought I said I wanted to play. Three and a half. She's like, no, you got to lay down. It's time to go to sleep. No, 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 Mama. I want to pray. So since we'd already prayed, she said, well, what do you want to pray? And I said, I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. I want to ask him to come into my heart so he'll wash away my sins so I can go to heaven one day. I heard it. I got it. I understood it. And she did not want to put words in my mouth. So she simply said, if that's what you want to do, Rochelle, then do it. And she tells me, because I don't remember, but she told me that I sat up in bed. I bowed my curly little head, still curly. I folded my hands. And I said simply, dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Wash away my sins so I can go to heaven someday. Amen. And with that, I lay down and went to sleep. Oh, one voice, one hearing. God speaking, are you hearing? All you have to do is say yes. And I'll tell you first, there has to be a physical restoration and then the spiritual. God has to put a new heart in you. And that's what will make you the new creation that you can do whatever God is asking you to do. So if your tongue is hearing, I want to be saved. Answer that call. And then if your tug is hearing, 
do this for me. Take the step. Find out that God will give you everything you need and it will be the best answer. God put me here today. God enabled me to do what I'm doing today. God gave me that background, poured it into this little heart, and it's God. It's not me. Believe me, I live with me, okay? <laughs> it's my God, and I want him to get all the glory. But what he began, he is completing. And it's not just for me, and it's not just for a little Jewish girl. It's for any and all, Jewish or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, poor or rich, there's no exception. I know I ran long, but please hear the voice of the Lord. I call this tonight one voice. Remember Yochanan, the voice crying in the wilderness? One voice, one voice. If you're saved, will you be a voice for the Lord? And if you're not saved, will you hear and answer his voice? his call. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, Elohim Haimos, High God, Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior, our Mashiach, Messiah, oh, we praise you and we thank you. You are amazing and awesome and you do the perfect work. We are not perfect, but you perfect in us and we thank you and we praise you. And for any that are hearing tonight that need to start that, that relationship with you, Lord, may they at this very moment say, yes, I want you in my heart. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be the Lord of my life. May they open up. May they not be afraid. May they not use any excuse. And may they realize even if they think they're a drip, what you can do with a drip. And Lord, for any who have made that commitment and are now hearing that tug, you've been asking them to do something, maybe for a day, maybe for a year, maybe for 20 years. Lord, may they right now say, yes, I'll take that step of faith and I'll trust you to do it all, God, because it's you who does it. It's by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. It's not by ourselves. Lord, thank you. You take mere dust and you do something amazing. You make a new creation and then you fill it with your power to glorify you. Lord, we want to be on your side. We want to praise you. We want to serve you. We want to please you. And let it be, even today, even tonight, that we renew and refresh ourselves. Or we'll renew ourselves in making a commitment that you might refresh us. May we put our roots down deep in the well of our salvation that we might be satiated in a well-watered garden by the hand of our loving God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Hallelujah. What you have said, you do, and you will complete it. To you be all glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>